and then we can start the meeting. Yeah. Yes. Can somebody who's on the Zoom um, just kind of speak up so we can see uh, if we can hear you? Yes. Yeah, we hear you fine. We can, I can hear. hear. You. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome to the April meeting for Central Park United Neighbors. Um, for those who are joining us for the first time, uh, Central Park United Neighbors is the registered neighborhood organization or RNO for the Central Park community. We provide a working forum for residents of Central Park to participate in creating social equity. In meetings, we facilitate problem solving, uh, and CPUN is committed to providing an inclusive and welcoming environment for all members of our community. Next slide. Our mission is the betterment of the city of Denver by providing a forum for residents living in Central Park to discuss and resolve issues, a network of communication, and a means of acting on matters of importance to the community as a whole. We promote pub public service, civil civic discourse, uh, and collective efficacy. We're an all volunteer board of Central Park residents and a registered 501c3. Next slide. Um, so we have a pretty full agenda tonight uh, for our community hour. Uh, we'll go through CPUN committee updates and announcements, um, some brief community partner updates. Um, then we'll have our guest speaker is Maggie Thompson uh, from the brief break. And then during our board hour, uh, we'll go over the treasurer's report. Um, they have an announcement of an officer vacancy coming up in June uh, for board members. Um, and then we'll do an outreach update uh, and kind of update on some needs around outreach and communications. Uh, we'll brainstorm some future meeting planning. Um, and then we'll actually have a, a kind of closed session for a board recruitment update. for uh, selecting the new board candidates. Okay, um, is Mandel on the uh, on the Zoom? For the DEI committee update? I didn't have a chance to check. Okay. Uh, I, I don't see- Hear me okay? Yeah, Hold on, really in the other room. <laughs> can we go? Can we go out of order this time? Uh sure. Amanda, okay. would you be able to give the education update? Sure. Very fresh on my mind. All right, next slide. Yeah, discussed a handful of. Oh. Okay. I tried to update the slide at the very last minute, but I don't think it's saved. Oh, okay. That's too bad. Oh, well. Okay, well, at the April meeting, uh, we discussed the new principal um, at McAuliffe, the incubator lab at Northfield High School, and a potential upcoming informational talk uh, regarding uh, school choice. And, uh, and that's that. Uh, just a reminder that the GP Yes, advisory uh, board is uh, group is discussing the bond for um, new infrastructure and um, DPS, and they have a meeting coming up at the end of this month at Manual High School. Uh, people are free to speak during open comment about meeting Northfield High School or a, an auditorium for the Sandoval campus, which includes Northfield High School and DSSG Conservatory Green. Uh, will be discussed in the pursuit of passion subcommittee. Um, and again, they're meeting uh, at. Uh, Manual High School on the 30th of this month. Share in the chat just the link to sign up for that. Yes, yes, I and I just have a quick question about the informational talk about choice. Is that during a committee meeting or? No, that needs to be coordinated with you. Oh. Okay. So that will be probably a future CPUN meeting. Okay. That sounds good. Um, Safe Streets, I think, Amy, you're here. Yeah. We had our last meeting conversation about 
ideas to bring back to the District 8 Council Offices Community Panel on Transportation, which I'm sitting on. Um, and our next meeting will be June 4th, 3 p.m. via Zoom. And it looks like there's a link to information on the CPUN website. Thank you. Um, Mandel, are you able to um, provide the update now, or did you want yeah, Carol? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I was, uh, so just to be candid with everybody, I've got some muscle spasm action going on with my neck. And so um, I was trying to record it, so I didn't have to do it. Uh, but anyway, I ran out of time, so I'm just going to run through that as best I can right now. So we had a meeting and we talked about a uh, community book reading initiative and Daryl uh, community book reading initiative. We're going to be focusing on the CPUN board. This approach aims to lead by example in DEI efforts, addressing the previously noted low participation of the members, um, of the board members in the DEI events. So, Daryl had, um, we're gonna be getting out and kind of going over those things and how that's gonna play out. So we'll keep you abreast of that. Um, we also reviewed the DEI survey results um, and insight from those existing DEI surveys revealed experiences of discrimination and inclusion or exclusion, excuse me, among community members. So these findings, they highlight the critical need. Um, we also talked about the development of a new DEI survey. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're presenting the community with things that they need. So we want to address any unanswered questions and find out how we can better serve our community through some DEI focused events and educational initiatives. Our, our next meeting, we wanna have it in person because, you know, uh, we used to meet at the rec center and that was a really good way to connect. And, you know, it, it, I think it's, it's better to be able to meet with people, look at them eye to eye and um, really make that connection. So our new meeting in May is gonna be in person. Um, we'll, We'll get you a location for that, uh, so you'll have plenty of time to attend. If that's what you The next thing was raised by Carol. This is INC stuff that she's heavily involved in. So um, we wanted to see if we can get support for for our RNOs and other DEI initiatives from the INC. Um, she's reached out to them uh, a few times trying to get some information about uh, possible DEI principles that they're going to be using in their operations and enhancing inclusion and equity within the community, etc. Um, finally, we've got a tribute to Connie Turner. Jamie highlighted the contributions of Connie Turner a retired CU Denver Anthropology Department coordinator known for her advocacy for diversity, inclusion, and acceptance. And then Lorna Moore with a commitment to match donations of up to $31,250. And this, uh, this is a match again so the committee discussed methods to promote this initiative, respecting Connie's wish for hum humility by not publicizing her image, which is kind of difficult because we wanna make sure that it is known that this is a black woman who has done some very good things in the community. So that's gonna be a challenge, but we wanna get this message out and uh, we're gonna attempt to see if we can survey or circulate that through uh, some of these lists that the surveys went to. So that's it. Thank you. That actually leads us into Carol's INC uh, update. Very 
very briefly it was completely focused on vision zero it was a wonderful panel informative worthy uh, very frank uh, upfront in terms of the information and the attitudes and what they understand uh, people's frustrations are and uh, as soon as it goes on video or the video is ready i'm going to post it in our newsletter and in other ways because it's just it's so worth it yeah i don't think there's a person well i'm exaggerating there are some but very few people in uh, central park don't have a story to tell about safety about street safety whether they're talking about their children or they're talking about their themselves as runners. I have a particular thing around the uh, Northfield High School track team, which practices at night and in the morning, and they are not safe on 49th place. So um, at any rate, it's a it's it's very worthwhile and it jives beautifully. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Karen, have you contacted Lola Means? I'm going to. That's the next person on my list. Yeah. I was going to say she's the one to get in touch with. Got it. About that. Got it. Thank you. Um, so, okay, next slide. Uh, we have the Central Park Classic Mini Golf Tournament uh, coming up. So, Matt Blackburn. Thank you. Um, the Central Park Mini, Mini Golf Classic is co sponsored by the Central Park Business Association and CPUNT. Um, we're excited to continue the tradition of friendly competition and community spirit with the second annual Central Park Mini Golf Classic at Flight Co Tower, Sunday, May 19th from noon to 6 p.m. Visit the CPUNT website to book your tea time. A limited number. Response the email in the chat info at centralparkbusiness.com if you have inquiries about sponsorship. Uh, links are also on the website. Uh, so you can link from the CPUN website to buy tickets, uh, QR code right there on the screen, or um, and then you can link from that to the sponsorship page as well. Uh, there'll be food and drink specials, prizes, and fun for the whole family. Don't miss the second annual Central Park Classic as soon to be time honored tradition. I'll link in the chat as well. Um, so for community partner updates, um, since I think that we want to make sure that we have enough time for the guest speaker. So for tonight's community partner updates, we'll do City Council District 8, uh, Denver Police, um, I think the Master Community Association. And then we also um, we have... Uh, um, since uh, to kind of introduce themselves and talk about some upcoming events. Um, for our other community partners, if you're on Zoom uh, and wanted to give an update, if you could actually just email me um, some of your updates and we'll include that in the next community email that's going out on Monday. Um, so just wanted to kind of give a quick, um, just kind of quickly explain why we have just a smaller number of folks this month. Um, so Jesse's here from um, the city council office. Ron, uh, I'm Jesse Carey. I'm Councilwoman Lewis's uh, policy aide for city council district eight. Um, trying to keep this pretty short tonight, but uh, for the 2025 budget updates, uh, the kickoff for um, the annual city council budget season has actually started. On March 22nd, City Council convened and sort of threw up there in the next budget. Um, the next stage of the process on May 3rd, City Council will, will again convene as a body um, and drop sort of their proposals to meet those goals that they want to actualize. Um, and we collect data on um, what our communities want to see in that uh, May 3rd retreat and, and what they want us to advocate for um, through two primary methods. The first one is the town hall feedback. Um, last year, we collected feedback from every town hall that we did. 78% uh, of the comments that we received that were actually within the sort of jurisdiction of the council office to address were included in the letter to the mayor. Um, and so we really fight for that and we prioritize that. Um, Additionally, we are running these community panels, as I mentioned in previous meetings, on transportation, uh, climate, and uh, uh, safety through environmental design. Uh, and we're 
drawing and return policy projects that um, that each district. Um, additionally, if you email district at denvergov.org email um, with a specific budget proposal that you would like to see within this budget, um, we do monitor that email. Um, I personally track those and we make sure that we try to include that information as well. So if you have something you would like to see for the neighborhood, um, please email that district aid at denvergov um, and we'll take a look at it and, and uh, try to get that included in the uh, letter to the mayor, which um, will come after the May 3rd meeting. Um, wanted to touch on on the budget cuts update um, from the mayor, um, as, as you guys are all aware, there are um, budget cuts as a, res as a result of the uh, migrant response from the city. Um, the update here is that originally it started as a $180 million deficit. Um, it has since been re revised. Down 45 million of that or 44 million of that um, has been uh, sort of addressed through budget savings already. Um, and then the remaining $45 million shortfall um, will be addressed uh, by basically um, finding other budget, uh, other budget sources that we can uh, pull from to assign more money from the general fund, that's unencumbered dollars, uh, back into the city of Denver's uh, uh, available spending. Uh, there's a lot of vacancy savings from unfilled positions, um, but the long and short of it really is that with the new budget cuts update, um, all of the rec centers will be reopening and resuming regular service. Um, there will be no cuts to fire, police, or any of the essential services, um, and any of the additional cuts that are going to be made will not affect um, sort of the public-facing um, city of Denver services. Uh, the mayor's safety meeting, uh, the mayor has identified uh, gun violence uh, reduction as, as two of his, uh, as, as one of his major um, campaign or office priorities this, uh, this coming year. Um, two of the five locations are within District 8. Neither of them are in Central Park. One is in Montbello, one is in East Colfax. Um, he is convening uh, community meetings to try to address gun violence holistically. So um, looking at targeted enforcement actions that DPD can do, um, but also looking at some of the environmental design factors in those areas to address why um, those areas are so, um, uh, why there's so much gun violence in those two areas. Um, moving on to the RTD bill, uh, this is actually a bill at the state house. Uh, currently uh, public testimony is tomorrow within the uh, Colorado house. Um, this is kind of a bad deal for Denver, at least in the councilwoman's opinion. Uh, it really reduces the amount of um, representation that Denver will get in terms of how RTD will be run in the future. Um, and it doesn't really address the things that it says it, it, it will. Um, the consistent messaging from RTD is that we need they need more funding for um, operations, um, and this is just changing the governance structure to give the state more of a heavy hand in how this regional um, this regional sort of municipal corporation is being run. Um, and so if you have concerns about this RTD bill or you want to know more, um, again, please reach out to District 8. I'd be happy to touch base with you and, and give you more of the in-depth rundown on it. Um, but testimony on that bill is tomorrow. Um, and if you would like to know who your representative is as well, again, just reach out and, and we can provide you with that information so you can let them know um, your concerns. Um, and then you can stay in touch by signing up to the uh, weekly, the district eight uh, email that I've mentioned several times. Thank you. Any questions? Great. Um, Okay, go ahead. Well, I had a question in terms of the budget cuts. You said it wasn't going to affect any outward facing services, but what will it, the, those cuts affect? So, those will, the, the primary areas that have actually been identified are um, vacancy savings. So, what that is, is that those are positions that have been basically unfilled for two or three years within agencies. Um, so, basically, uh, they're, they're already open positions. Instead of filling them this year, they'll just leave them open for one more year. Um, Additionally, that is um, targeting sort of like the agency supply budget um, for any given agency and just reducing that by um, a couple of percentage points. Um, there's a couple of other cuts to uh, 
might have some community impact, just if you're not aware that, that some programs are happening. Um, but in terms of like the difference between a marketing program that lets you know that there is this resource versus like the closure of a rec center, it's, it's, it's less, certainly. Thank you. Um, all right, we'll move on to uh, Lieutenant Hines. I believe it's on the scene. Yeah, good morning or good evening. Can everybody see me? Okay, so no, there we go. I kind of lost my screen there for a moment. Well, hey, everyone. Thanks for having me on tonight. I just wanted to give a couple updates, uh, kind of circling back on some of the stuff we talked about on one of the other recent meetings that I joined you on. Um, one of the issues we were seeing uh, in District 5, and particularly in the Central Park neighborhood, was a large increase in retail theft this year. A lot of uh, well, it's one area we've been trying to work on getting under control, and uh, we recently conducted a anti shoplifting operation with our business watch partners uh, in the Central Park area. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, we run a business watch group uh, through District Five. This operates uh, somewhat similarly to what you would see as a neighborhood watch, but more targeted towards the needs of our business partners in the area. So we uh, got together and planned out an undercover operation with uh, a handful of our partners in the uh, shops at Northfield area. And uh, they brought in some extra loss prevention people. We brought in our undercover officers and some uniformed personnel and set up a sting just to try to make it, uh, make it obvious that uh, uh, conducting crime is, is going to get you caught eventually. We, managed to bring this operation. Uh, one of those arrests involved a pattern thief who had actually hit Cherry Creek uh, just before coming up to the shops at Northfield, and we caught that individual with stolen merchandise from both locations. And a fifth felony arrest was made for an individual where we couldn't actually prove the shoplifting charges on them, but they were um, also uh, wanted for some felony-level thefts. Um, Along those lines, dealing with the retail crime, our District 5 investigations team actually filed two felony level cases this week against habitual shoplifters they've also been looking for in the area of the shops at Northfield. Um, the first individual was somebody that they had uh, nicknamed the Minute Man because this individual generally spent less than a minute in any store that he went into. Um, however, we were able to file 10 cases with the DA's office against this individual for over $3,000. In this individual, he indicated that he would steal merchandise, take it downtown to trade the merchant, stolen merchandise for fentanyl. He would get high on fentanyl, and when he when his high wore off, he would go steal more merchandise and kind of repeat the cycle. Um, in the second case, we were able to file uh, two cases against another individual, totaling around two thousand dollars. This individual is also a known and habitual shoplifter, so. A um, great amount of work has gone into this from both our investigative teams and our undercover officers just to try to um, reduce this crime a little bit in the Central Park area. In the past 28 days, we have seen a 28.3% decrease in shoplifting cases in uh, Precinct 511, which is where Northfield Mall is located. Another area I wanted to update you on was uh, 4040 Quebec Street. A lot of questions about this. That is Tree Hotel that was uh, one of the initial sites for the House 1000 project. Um, as many of you know, there were some newsworthy and unfortunate crimes that had occurred within that facility. And our team has uh, been working closely with the mayor's office, um, other stakeholders in the community, host uh, the Salvation Army who operates the facility to try to figure out ways to make this facility more secure. Uh, a number of changes have actually been made to the physical security at the site. There's now 24-7 uh, uh, security officers on site watching all of the exit doors. We also screen for weapons at the entrance to the facility and uh, um, run people through magnetometers to make sure that they're not bringing in any weapons to the facility. Um, we've helped the Salvation Army develop some more clear and uh, concise policies 
in warrant calls when they catch them with contraband. And we also engaged in a large uh, multi-agency security sweep at the location uh, a couple of weeks ago where we uh, engaged uh, DPD, host, Salvation Army, um, General Services, uh, Securitas, and uh, made sure that we did a sweep of the facility to remove any weapons and contraband that were in there before the security measures were put in place. Um, in doing so, we found quite a bit of contraband, some ammunition, some other items, and uh, I think everybody feels that we've made the facility safer by getting those items out of there. Um, we're continuing to work with the facility and the other neighboring businesses and community members to try to make sure that we um, help this place become a good neighbor for everybody. And uh, we have seen um, our peak when the facility opened in January, we had the most calls for service, went down a bit in February, um, fairly similar in March and uh, to month to day. It's just some progress there, I'm happy to say. Uh, final thing I want to say here, and I don't want to take up too much of anyone's time, but we are having our district uh, commanders meeting this Thursday, April 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, you can join us in person by coming to our District 5 station at 12025 East 45th Avenue, or you can join us virtually on Microsoft Teams. But we would love to see you there. And uh, during that meeting, we'll dive a little deeper into all the statistics regarding crime and things that are taking place in the neighborhood. But uh, um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I don't want to take up too much of your time tonight. Um, and thinking of contraband, is there a, do they have access to safe storage for weapons or other items that are contraband in the facility that they would have access to outside of it? So um, are, are you saying when items are confiscated, what happens to them? Or are you asking if they're holding weapons for individuals who are staying there? Before they check into the facility, they have the opportunity to safely store weapons that may be not allowed in the facility, but are allowed you know, in their life outside of the facility. No, and that's uh, th that's up to the discretion uh, to a certain degree of the Salvation Army and how they want to operate it. Um, but at this time, my understanding is that they're given the choice to um, leave with the contraband or surrender the contraband there at the uh, at the entrance to the facility. Um, they're not allowing any of it in there. I don't think things like weapons or um, drugs up, uh, you know, in the in the facility for folks. Thanks. No problem. Oh, and then Lieutenant Hines in the chat, uh, if you could post the link to the Google Teams uh, commander's meeting. Um, yeah, Excuse I have. I had a feeling somebody was going to ask that. I'll see if I can dig up the link here and put it in there. I was already thinking of the fact that I didn't have it on the slide. So I'll uh, try to get it in the chat here in a moment. Okay. Um, I actually have a quick question. If, um, what is, can you talk more openly about what is being done about the open, the drug use that is happening out in the open much more frequently near Chick-fil-A and Walmart and a lot of places where a lot of the housing initiatives are happening. It's it's definitely become much more open. And I mean, and I was at Chick-fil-A the other day and it's right there. In yeah, the that's certainly something we're trying to address. We do have um, a narcotics team in District 5 does a lot of undercover work for us. Um, they also work with our District 5 anti-crime team and uh, pair up for a lot of operations. Uh, through the uh, operations they've done at the House 1000 sites, they have identified and arrested, I think, um, not positive on this, I think it's four dealers since the beginning of the year just related to those sites. Uh, what we found is a lot of the people that we find uh, dealing narcotics outside of those facilities are not just uh, servicing that one facility, but are going around to multiple spots within the district and within the city. So um, catching an individual there can actually reduce um, incidences of drug dealing throughout the uh, throughout the city. So uh, um, 
in near Walmart, the Home Depot, over by Chick Fil A, up by the the hotel itself, and in numerous other areas. So, um, although we can't be on top of everything at any one time, uh, our narcotics unit does work kind of, uh, I guess you could say, in the shadows. You won't see them out there in their cars. They're driving vehicles that wouldn't stand out. They're not wearing police uniforms, but they're doing surveillance to identify the dealers that are out there victimizing. Um, people who are dealing with addiction here in the community and trying to uh, bring them to justice. And one of the things they try to work on is actually identifying the people who are dealing rather than just the user who is out there, um, you know, uh, suffering with an addiction. We'd rather identify the person who's actually, um, you know, victimizing these folks by selling fentanyl and, and meth and, and other narcotics. So, are trying to uh, find locations where that's occurring and stop it. One thing I would say for anybody in the community, if you and drug transactions or things like that, reach out to us at the District 5 station to make us aware of it and we can get some more resources to that spot. Um, as you can imagine, we don't always know exactly where these spots are occurring, but we certainly try to hit the ones where we do know that's taking place. We have something that's a little bit relevant also, which is relevant. Um, this is Liz speaking. I, somebody sent me a text and said, um, for those of us who are in the cube, like to identify ourselves, like so that folks on the Zoom. So Tricia, um, thank you. Uh, just as I serve on the Good Neighbor Agreement Committee for the Quebec Street Corridor uh, shelters. Um, and something that we've asked for, um, so the in, in what, what they report out is kind of how folks who are dealing with um, substance use uh, like problematic substance use are uh, like what sort of services are actually being offered, how many folks are in methadone or suboxone treatments, um, and just basically like what what kind of wraparound services are being offered um, and what the uptake is um, and just, and what are the successes around that? So that kind of covers like some of the, the substance use side of it in addition to the dealing that DPD was talking about. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so, okay, uh, thank you, Lieutenant Hines. Uh, next slide, uh, Diane. You. Um, hello. I'm Diane Dieter with the MCA, and we have basically our, our each on the May 1st issue, and so be on the lookout for that. But just some other additional events coming up. Um, we have, as you can see up there, the Beer Fest flyer, which uh, tickets have gone on sale April 1st, so they're on sale now. And our pools and parks are getting ready for the summer. It does look like a uh, pedal jumper will be up and running and ready to go for this year. We're very excited about it. They're installing the tile in the bathroom right now. Well, not right now, but at this time period, he might still be there. Yeah, he might still be there. Um, and then the kids try registration opens um, tomorrow, I believe. I think that's right. So a couple other things. The Denver Arts Green on Saturday, Sunday, May 25th and 26th. On Saturday, it goes from 10 to 6. On Sunday, it goes 10 to 5. Uh, back in April, we have the migrant market that we are working with the newcomers group. And we're going to host a, a market of their goods and wares and crafts and all things uh, that they are making currently. And it will be out on the green from 10 to 4, Saturday, April 27th. So come one, come all, and uh, have fun. At, it's going to be a festival. And let's see. We have the week, which is kind of an Earth Day event that we have coming up in May on the 7th. Let's see. It's the 
7th have an hour long video followed by a discussion of the group and it's it's talking about the relevancy of climate change and what has been going on what can what is happening how long will it take and then what can we do so three different discussions over three different days but that is going to be put on by the front porch and we're hosting it here and that's i think covers it just the next slide actually also has like the rest of, <laughs> the rest of it. Um, but we can just kind of go through that and folks will get that at their front porch. And we do have, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Liz, but we do have some uh, flyers, the calendar, the Bear Fest flyer, all of that on the table right outside if you want to grab one or we have it downloaded. You can download so I've got a quick question. On the website. Could. Um, how yes. are you guys advertising for like the art art festivals for artists who want to participate but don't necessarily know when they're going on? The Denver Art Festival is not something that actually we put on. It is put on by another entity um, and they go out every year. They typically go out at the end of 20, they'll go out at the end of 2024 for this next year. And they usually have their um, selections by the very beginning of the following year. Um, and, you know, if you're interested, I could give you the contact for that. Yeah, that would be great. And then we could publicize that. Yeah, because that is, that is the Denver Arts Festival. Is done by a totally different, like, you know, it. if we were to bring the Cherry Creek Arts Festival, we really don't have any connection to getting people into it. However, we do I have agree. the Six Park open, open Studios in the fall, and that will be coming up. And I do think they have actually just closed their um, request for participants, but I think they have like 30 or more participants for this for it for uh, this event coming up at the end of September. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone, I will be super quick. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Sand Creek Regional Greenway. We've connected with CPEN, so I just wanted to kind of reintroduce Sand Creek. Um, uh, the Sand Creek Regional Greenway is a partnership that works with Aurora, the city of Denver, and Commerce City um, to steward a, about a 13 mile stretch along Sand Creek. So both the natural environment around Sand Creek and then also the, the trails, the recreation trails themselves. Um, Sand Creek is a really cool organization. They have a lot of fun things going on, um, volunteer opportunities and community outreach events. I put a few up here um, that are coming up in the next uh, about six weeks, but there's also quite a bit more um, on the website. So I encourage you to check out the website and sign up for, um, sign up for, have a month separate listserv for the volunteer events and for the community events. Um, this summer, a couple of things to keep your eyes out for um, is a, we're doing another mural festival. Um, I don't know if any of you know along Sand Creek, so it's kind of where Westerly Creek meets Sand Creek a little bit to the west there. There are some beautiful murals, so every year Sand Creek has um, pledged to sponsor a mural along the stretch of the big concrete wall there, and they have an opportunity for the community to come and help start to paint the mural. It's a really fun event, so keep your eyes and ears open for that. That'll come this summer, and then our big fundraiser it's called the Night on the Greenway, um, and that's also coming up this summer, a really fun evening. So I um, just wanted to come and say hi, and we'll uh, be more of a regular presence at these meetings um, from here on out. So thanks so much. Uh, 
Um, Maggie Thompson with the Denver Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Um, Maggie is on Zoom. Um, all right. So welcome, Maggie. Thank you. Um, and just as a quick heads up, I do have a hard stop at 7.30. So I'm going to do my best to get through um, all of my notes here and the questions that Liz sent me um, earlier this week that I was able to dig into. Um, but just some quick um, introductions real quick. My name is Maggie Thompson. I have been at the city and county of Denver for just over 10 years. Um, first, about eight and a half, nine years of that, I spent over at city council working primarily in district seven. So that is South Central Denver. Um, I have more recently come over here to the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure, where I do um, a, a position called community design. And it's a very, very, uh, information about what I do um, and who I am and, and what that means in the Dottie world. Um, so we are primarily working within our implementation team. So when we do projects here at Dottie, um, we start at a high level where we're making citywide plans, neighborhood plans, et cetera. Um, those plans eventually get funded um, and those funded plans come down to our implementation team. So we are the group that is putting things on the ground, um, paying attention to how do we program each of these projects in every construction year. Um, and so we work hard to make sure that projects are getting delivered as quickly as possible um, once we get them funded. Um, I am also the liaison to our area engineer team for council districts 8, 9, and 11. So I always tell people everything from the ballpark out to DIA is my territory projects throughout that area. Um, we have, um, well, Currently, we have three traffic engineers who work in our area engineering program. Um, one thing that was mentioned by District 8 earlier was those vacancy savings that we've got over here um, at the city, how we're meeting those budget cuts. Um, one of those is uh, so are some folks that we do wish we had. Um, and one of those are some more people in, in, in our team, in particular, some more folks to be on that area engineer team. We are approximately in a position where each of our three one one cases um, revolving around traffic related issues are an approximately um, three to five month queue um, for an engineer to get to those items and be able to look at those items um, and get an answer back to folks. So I'll talk a little bit more about 311 later. Uh, information from the community and unfortunately um, we are in a bit of a lag right now due to the resources that we have at the city um, to be able to answer folks questions. So um, just a little bit more about me and my background. Um, I before I was at Dottie um, and before I was at City Council, I was a professional bicycle advocate both here in Denver and back in my um, original uh, home area of Washington, D.C. Um, I worked in the Safe Routes to School program for many years, helped bring that out to the state of Colorado. So very familiar um, with that program and its funding. Um, I'm also a mom and I've been a District 9 resident for close to 20 years now. So I've been in Denver for quite some time and seen some big changes that we've seen throughout the city. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk through with you guys um, is a little bit about our 3 one one program. So um, we call it either through one of that doesn't exist anymore. So we're trying to make sure we use the right nomenclature, but that is the um, service that when you go to the denvergov.org page, um, if you click on uh, report a problem, that's where you're gonna be able to report things like potholes, traffic signal outages, um, missed traffic or missed um, garbage pickups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those items, when they are routed to um, our team over in implementation and engineering. Like I said, they go to an area traffic engineer. Sometimes they go to the parking team who we will work with, or sometimes they'll go over to the plan team. Um, and sometimes we work with them to get answers back to folks. Um, but primarily anything traffic engineering related comes over to our group. Um, the reason I mentioned that is twofold. Um, one, that is how we collect data. Um, we have been, um, tasked for many years at the city to be a data-driven organization versus in a manner 
that um, obviously is respectful to the fact that we are a public entity um, and putting things where we truly need them. So we collect data through the 301 system, um, through a number of other things that we do, like traffic counts um, throughout the city. Um, and that's how we begin to um, that's how we begin to, to divvy out our limited resources that we have here. Um, we get a lot of questions about why projects aren't moving forward or what the status of projects is. And so a quick overview of that is we have an entire team that plans for what should be happening in the city. Um, we have uh, some really great um, planning documents like Denver Moves Everyone, which is our vision for the city and how we um, move folks around the city safely. Um, and efficiently and, and uh, that opportunities to fulfill that plan, um, we move those projects forward. Um, the biggest thing that we have to obviously pay attention to are budgets for those kinds of things. And so one thing I like to point out to people is, um, especially since District 8 brought up the annual budget process, which is just now kicking off, is um, our discretionary budget or our annual budget portion of what we do at DOTI is actually quite small. It's a few million dollars. Um, we do not do the majority of the building of things in the city and county of Denver um, on our roadways out of the annual budget. The two major resources that we have for that are our bond program. So I'll tell you a little bit uh, in a few minutes about some bond projects coming to District 8 um, in the next year. Um, and then the other component to that are our um, you may have seen in the news received a large grant for the GES area um, up in North Central Denver, um, where we are going to be able to utilize some connecting communities funding to um, enhance some projects up there, deal with some super fun sites that we're remediating um, and connect some communities that have been very physically um, divided out from the city for many years um, through things like bridges and other uh, major infrastructure going on there. One of the reasons I bring up those items is you will probably see a bond program coming around um, before too long that bonds are approved by the voters in the city and county of Denver. So I encourage everyone in this room, because I know many of you are passionate about transportation projects and getting transportation projects moving forward and funded, um, to pay attention to that bond project and to speak up. There will be public involvement in those bond projects. There will be council involvement in those bond projects. Um, um, those bond projects that are specific to neighborhood level um, traffic issues. Um, it's great when we can do a big corridor. It's great when we can do a big infrastructure project. But as we all know, sometimes it's that intersection where you're walking your kid to school or um, the, the issue that's happening down the street from your house that you really feel like um, isn't getting the attention it needs. And sometimes that's simply because we don't have the resources um, to go in and, and do those kinds of things. So um, those are a few things I wanted to point out, just big picture as far as Dottie's concerned. I do see, I'm just gonna check real quick. I see something in the chat here um, and wanted to see if it was anything that I needed to respond to. Nope, okay, great. So that was just, um, the commander's meeting information there. So um, Liz was kind enough to send me a series of questions um, that she was hoping I could give some answers to tonight. So what I did want to preface this with is many of these items and many of these questions are things that um, I discuss with the um, Safe Streets Committee from CPUN. So Amy and Carol and I have set up a cadence where we are meeting quarterly to go through a list of items. Um, what I will say is everything on that list of items is something that was born in a 311 case. So if you have something that's been in your craw that you want to get in as a 311 case, please do that. And then let the folks over at the Safe Streets Committee know um, that you've got an issue that you'd love follow up on. Um, we have more than 300 RNOs in the city, uh, and there's four community designers. So doing presentations um, at RNO meetings, uh, something I'm I'm happy to do, but I do have to spread my resources throughout the city. So the likelihood is I wouldn't be 
able to Gare perhaps. Um, but what I can do is continue that communication cycle with Amy and Carol um, and make sure that we are um, moving forward and finding out what the next steps are in, um, in some of these Central Park issues that um, aren't easy fixes, that are going to take time, that are going to take money, but um, we're paying attention to them and, and figuring out creative ways to move things forward when that's feasible. Um, so the first question I have is, can we see a list of Dottie projects in Central Park and or District 8? Um, the short answer is not yet. Um, the longer answer is I do have some big projects I can tell you about tonight right off the bat that are being um, installed during the 2024 program. Um, the reason we don't have a main list yet is we are in the process of migrating from one project management software to another. Um, our director, Amy Ford, has promised that we will be getting these lists to the council offices soon. June. guys who need to figure that out over um, in our IT department. Um, but for the time being, I don't have access to a comprehensive list. Um, the items that I do have that I wanted to bring up that you'll see either some plan talk about or some actual construction um, this summer are um, sooner than later, you're going to hear about the replacement of the Smith and Sandown bridges over Quebec. Um, so basically taking you, we're talking about that Chick-fil-A area, um, taking you from Home Depot over to um, the east side or the west side there. Um, I refer to that as my secret back way to get to Home Depot. Um, so that will probably mess up my route for a while to go pick up gardening supplies. But um, we will be replacing both of those bridges, adding bicycle and pedestrian facilities um, to both of them. Um, Smith is called out long term as a bicycle facility. There will be a multi-use path along Smith Road. Um, and so that bridge will be built. Um, Victoria at the Colorado station and Central Park station for our bicyclists and pedestrians and of course transit users. Um, so we will also be in installing these sidewalks along Quebec between 11th and Montview this year. So if you travel through that area like my husband does on his way to Anschutz every day, um, just a heads up, there is going to be construction along um, along Quebec there. As I'm sure many of you know, some of your kids might go to St. Elizabeth's or whatnot. There are no sidewalks in that area along the Mosaic campus leading up to Colfax Avenue um, and going further down towards Lowry. Um, so that area will be getting bond funded sidewalks this year. You should start to see some construction happening there. Um, there will also be a replacement of the light at 17th and Quebec. Um, that is something that is important to point out because um, as you may notice, as you look around our city, we have many generations of traffic signals. Um, the hanging from wires. I refer to those as uh, the flip phone of, of traffic signals. Those um, are not very programmable. Those have very limited capability to be um, remotely accessed by our signal team. Um, and so we like to upgrade those whenever we have a chance um, so that we can make those operations function better um, for everyone involved. Um, one of the things that we are now doing as a, ma a matter of policy is every time we touch a traffic signal in the city, we are adding what's called a lead pedestrian interval there. So you may notice in some places um, you go to start your walk across the street when you get your little white walking man um, and you have between two and five seconds lead before uh, traffic that's going parallel to you gets the green light. That allows folks to um, establish their place in the intersection and other cities have seen a significant decrease in and made that a manner um, of policy across the city. So we are starting to do that and upgrade our signals to get to the point where we can do that um, because those flip phone signals simply can't. Um, if you uh, use 35th Avenue near um, the Hiawatha Davis Rec Center at all, um, that is one of our newer bike routes that was installed last year. Um, we are upgrading a couple of blocks there north of um, Skyland Park um, to actually be a uh, multi-use street. Um, it will be getting speed bumps, which is super exciting. I just saw a work order um, go in today um, for we're testing some new um, rubberized speed bumps along there. They're on order. Hopefully they'll be in soon and we can get those installed. Um, and we hope to see successes there and be able to use those um, throughout the rest of the city. Um, we will also be installing a neighborhood bikeway um, along 
Kearney at the far north, um, where the Crossroads Shelter is along Smith Road, um, all the way south down to the Cherry Creek Trail. So um, through Mayfair, through Crestmore Park, all the way down um, to get folks to the Cherry Creek Trail parallel to Monaco. Um, I think this is going to be one of our longest bikeways we've ever put in. Um, so a very exciting north-south connection, um, good connection down to the Cherry Creek Trail and folks who are commuting by bike to places like DC, DTC. Um, that will also connect a lot of schools in the Park Hill area. So if you know anyone over there or perhaps your kids go to McAuliffe, um, it will go directly along the side of McAuliffe um, and connect a number of the schools um, north to south along that area. Um, and then last but not least, um, we are re-kicking off our Peoria multimodal project. So um, for anyone who likes to go up and enjoy um, do that along Peoria, um, there really aren't um, any bike safe options or even pedestrian safe options to get from um, the Peoria um, bus barn depot um, RTD site up to um, up to the Montbello neighborhoods and into um, the arsenal. So that's going to be kicking off before too long here and hopefully going into construction next year. Um, doing a quick time check, I'm getting close on time, but I'm gonna cruise through some more of these um, and hopefully get some updates. And if I don't get to everything, I will email Liz um, with my other answers. Um, the next one um, is a question about criteria for different kinds of warrants, um, which are the way that we decide if we do or don't use different street treatments. Um, my recommendation there is, especially if you are an engineering mind, to look up the, um, the MUTCD, um, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control. Um, you can look up specific types of um, treatments, what the warrants are there, but um, that is probably two or three semesters in traffic engineering school. So not something I can crank through in the next couple minutes here. Um, I will send Liz a link to that um, document document, which was recently updated by the federal government soon. Um, will there be bike racks as part of Colfax BRT? Yes, lots of them. Um, the team is really excited and working with businesses and community to get those, um, those installed uh, as Colfax BRT goes in. Um, does Dottie have any influence um, over traffic volumes in residential areas? I know this is a big question about as we're building new buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the good news is our plan team has recently hired um, someone to create a modeling program for us. So in the past, we um, this is on the types of street that community planning and development allows. So if it's a, an arterial street and it's allowed a multifamily building, um, the assumption is is that the, the traffic can be handled by that type of, of road. Um, what we will be doing in the future is some more high-tech modeling to see um, how we can balance the system, what we can expect in certain areas, um, that kind of stuff. Um, just a reminder that we are a built-out city. So our focus at DOTI um, is to get people to move around our city in the way that is efficient. So our hope is the folks who are maybe on the fence about using different modes, we can get them over to transit, we can get them over to biking, we can get them to, um, you know, maybe even, uh, maybe they're even um, remote working um, in some cases, um, because we simply can't build more capacity in our city. We don't how um, we're purchasing people's property from them as we do in most cases. So um, there is a lot to be said there. Um, perhaps, um, Liz, you and I can talk about getting someone from the plan team to come talk about that. Um, it's, a, it's a topic in and of itself. Um, so is there still the ability to get free bike racks for businesses? Yes, I'll send that link to Liz um, and we can get, um, if you have any businesses that you know of that are looking for bike racks, they do need to um, sign a declaration with the city that they will maintain those bike racks. Um, and they do have to help our folks from the city pick a spot for them and agree to that spot. So um, it's a pretty quick process. Um, and there's a whole website about that. Um, next question is about the exact dates of the most recent Emporia study. Um, I've checked in with our traffic engineering team. Um, I do not have exact dates for when that happened, um, but I have heard back from 
from them that they and it does not warrant any changes to Emporia Street as it um, is designed and built right now. Um, so the volumes uh, were not great enough to to call for any change um, in that stretch of street. Um, will DOTI be changing the way it prioritizes 311 complaints so that RNOs and city council offices carry more weight than requests from individual residents? Um, the short answer to that is no. Um, in order to maintain equity throughout the city, um, issues are taken on a first come first serve basis. Um, we do have um, regular check-ins with council offices and there are some items that we will um, that we will maybe prioritize in a timeline perspective, um, but we do our best um, to who are requesting them. Um, moment, so I we can I, so I appreciate yeah questions, but I think that um, if we want to kind of put a little bookmark in this um i do think having kind of a part two discussion with someone from planning because i think yeah. a big kind of one of the big conversations is how um between dotty and community planning and development how you do plan for growth and i think that a lot of us would be very interested in a longer conversation about that and just about what are the possibilities with the modeling um that's going to be coming yeah. online um because yeah. we will have Personally, um, development in particular, it, it would be interesting to know if if that would be you know modeled, like the kind of traffic impacts for that would be modeled. Um, but in any case, we can circle around. And then I think um, what I'll do is kind of spreadsheet. Um, um, so thank you for your time. I was going to let Amy uh, Kimball have just a moment to talk to folks about how to plug into the Safe Streets Committee. Um, and then that be that's kind of where follow up questions and answers will be flowing through. Um, so I just want to thank you for your time. Um, and this is a good beginning. Uh, and we'll kind of have a part two uh, soon. So thank Thanks you Thanks so, so much. Yes, and Amy and Carol are great. They have been doing an excellent job um, of relaying, you know, keeping a, a, a living document that we're working off of. And I think that's really important um, just from the sake of getting um, information kind of into one point of contact. Um, it just it saves me time. And, you know, I noticed that um, Mandel put in here that three to five month lead for engineering questions is unacceptable. And I totally agree. Um, I think that, um, you know, if you can, work with, with your counseling gets prioritized to different things within our city we have limited um you know limited funds um in general so um thank you guys so much for being passionate about traffic safety in your community um and you know we're going to continue to work um to make things uh the best we can and um we appreciate you guys being part of kind of that broader community advocating for more resources for us so thanks again and um and be well. Have a good night. I'm going to go get a toddler in the bathtub. But thanks so much. So now I'll turn this over to, I guess, Amy and Carol are the co-chairs for the Safe Streets Committee. Um, so I don't know if you want to go. The best way to plug into the committee, come to a meeting. Um, mm -hmm. You can reach out to CPON and ask to be put on our mailing list or put in contact with us. Um, maybe someone can put Uh, we have the contact form on the website. Yep. It'll be a good place for folks. That's kind of where we've been getting all be your questions. So I think if people have other questions, um, to keep using the contact form, and they, I think on that form they can indicate if they want to be added to a committee's mailing list. Um, so that would be a good way to kind of direct folks. Definitely. Just because I, I just worry if it's just your personal email addresses, um, that one, it's, Kind of, but yeah, it's just kind of to keep it a little more efficient for you. That that works for me, you know. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll I'm trying to give a to wide variety of options for people to plug in as as they see fit. So, yeah, and happy to email chat with anyone who's interested or has questions or wants to see um, the documents that we've compiled that Maggie was talking about, and we share them out in our meeting minutes. So those are all.
I think we're kind of also at time for the community hour, but um, I think that in June, we have June's meeting is usually dedicated to kind of committees 101. So if we can, I, we'll have an opportunity to kind of present more uh, at that point and talk more about how um, the work that, you know, I think you've learned so much work um, with Dottie and with the council office and just kind of being able to highlight all of that would be great. Um, I guess we can. Any any other questions right now? Um, but it sounds like we we kind of have kind of the start of a conversation, and then we'll have you know kind of more throughout the year. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we'll look ahead for May is the CPAN annual forum. We'll do kind of a year in review, uh, the board election, and then. Uh, update um, on from the district aid office and take questions and i'll also be reaching out to um our state legislative uh representatives because it's the end of the legislative session um so kind of talking about bills that have gotten passed what they are looking forward to um in next year's legislative session uh will also be part be part of that conversation so please join us it's may 21st 6 30 p.m um and so i know it's 737 now, if we can just take a five minute break. Um, so for folks um, can can join us for the board hour um, or log off or go now, um, but we'll just take a brief five minute break and then return for the board items. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, Let's see. So we'll just start with the uh, treasurer's report. Brian, uh, we can do so treasurer's report, officer vacancy, and then we'll just go through the agenda. Um, Brian, if you want to uh, give give your report. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's much everybody. We can read. Uh, we've seen some good uptick in sponsorship. We've got a few hundred dollars of tickets sold for the golf tournament. If you haven't bought your tickets, buy them now. Um, and then we um, we have, you know, every all of our most all of our expenses paid for the year. So right now we're just in maintenance mode until we um, hit the beginning of the year. So um, any questions? No. So just like that from other than the art of the powwow food reimbursement, all of those other expenditures are annual, right? So they won't come back again until next year. That is a true statement. Is that um, no, I take that okay. back. Mark Mailchimp is, is a monthly Mail cost of month. about a hundred bucks. Oh, okay. So it's about a hundred bucks a month for the Mailchimp. Okay. Yeah, I think um, that that figure is three months, and I think we're about to go below a hundred bucks a month going forward because we dipped below ten thousand uh, emails. I'm going to be working on getting that email list back up, but we'll, we can talk about that at a future meeting. Um, but okay, uh, no questions on, on that? We can move to the next slide. All right, so um, in June, so we have the, the board candidate election is in May, and then we vote on the officers in June. Um, so if anybody is interested, I don't know if we've ever had contested um, the officer elections, but I just want to let people know if you want to uh, kind of put your name in for one of the officer seats, uh, feel free. Um, but there will be a vacancy. Um, Mark Berenger will be uh, staying on the board, but stepping down as secretary. Um, so I just wanted to notify everybody on the board of that. Contact me. Uh, the secretary's functions are website updates, community emails, overseeing uh, social media, um, meeting and event reporting, um, and also chairs the comms and outreach committee, um, and then kind of different you know, subcommittees uh, issue kind of tasks within that. Um, and so, and Mark, I don't know if, if you want to make any, uh, I guess, any pitch or any statement right now, uh, but Mark has promised to onboard whoever takes that seat in June. So I, do, okay. <laughs> do, you, do you want to say anything, Mark? 
Sorry, I, I tried to hit my space bar on mute, but I think I hit the wrong key. Um, oh. Yeah, if anybody has any questions before that, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, you just send me an email or whatever, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions you have as well. Um, you know, I, I think we've done a good job. Uh, where did I go? Sorry, I missed, up, missed the thing. Um, with starting to spread out some of those those tasks. And I think if, if we have a full 19-member board, starting in June, it'll probably be even easier, hopefully, to do some of that. So, um, uh, but yeah, like I said, if you have any questions about about anything, you know, just let me know. Thank you. And yeah, we've had one, one person has expressed interest and I still need to talk to, but if there's anybody else, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, okay, we can move on to the next slide. Um, so just as we, we've been kind of, of doing for the past couple of months, instead of a separate comms and outreach meeting, just kind of updating everybody on the board about this. Um, so there are a number of volunteer needs around outreach. Um, so one is a uh, tabling opportunity where it's just kind of getting, you know, literally sitting at a table and telling people classic mini golf tournament is an opportunity for that so um, i'll circulate the volunteer link again uh, but that is one opportunity the mca uh, i spoke with diane uh, Dieter, and she is also happy uh, to give us a table at the different events that were all on that list so i mean that's a lot of uh events coming up in the next few months um so but we just kind of need to determine people's availability for which events so We'll be following up on that. And then again, there are the flyers just to kind of do outreach uh, to the apartment buildings. I actually flyered the library and kind of some different coffee shops before the um, before the board candidate deadline um, to try to get that. But we kind of need to do, you know, a little bit more of a concentrated effort uh, to reach out to the apartment buildings. Um, so what we really need is somebody I'm kind of at capacity myself um, for doing some of this. So if there's anybody, um, I, you know, anybody on the board now, or, you know, there there will be kind of like some new board members coming on. Um, but that is definitely a role that uh, we need help with um, in uh, communications and outreach. Um, one comms need uh, is um, social media help is just kind of getting posts up on the Facebook page. Um, and then circulating that out in into the different Facebook groups. And so Trisha has graciously offered to help uh, with that and or we'll be talking about what that process can look like. Um, but if there's anybody else who has the capacity and is on Facebook, because um, that's pretty much our social media platform, um, that that would be really helpful because um, I, I just have not had the time to consider page when the committees are meeting putting that on the facebook page when we have our monthly meetings um kind of providing enough advance notice for folks i think would be really helpful and we just kind of need a lot more consistency um, and more help with that um and then just finally um and we can also talk about it when I send out the email saying, hey, send, you know, things to add to the community emails, it doesn't just have to be committee meetings. Um, I've been kind of keeping track of the different, uh, uh, which we provide that get the most clicks. Um, and the property tax rebate thing, which you have to scroll down to get to um, on the community email, that by far always has the most clicks. Like it's always well over 100 people will click on that link. So it kind of provides really important information just about kind of sort of information is useful. Um, anything that is event related um, and, and yeah, just kind of human services resources is very useful. So I would really just want to rely on the board to just kind of whoever, you know, if there's any information that would be useful in that way that we can share out in our community emails. We usually have, um, I don't really know what open rates mean, but we generally are between 60 and 61% open rates of an email list of over 9,000 people. So it is reaching a lot of people. Um, so I just wanna kind of put that on everybody's minds. Um, and then uh, 
I don't know. Any anything else anybody wants to talk about with outreach uh, needs, or we can kind of move into the brain, like kind of the meat of this. As I wanted to talk about future meeting planning, um, and then the board candidate uh, update. Okay, we can we can move on to the next slide. Um, so. This is, I, I hope folks can kind of come with some ideas. Um, the next two meetings are pretty, you know, pretty standard. We have the annual forum coming up in May. I've already started the reach outs for folks to speak at that. Um, uh, I think Brian, I'm going to talk with you since we're about, we're more than 20 years, I guess, into the development. This is the 20th year for, um, Originally stable to United Neighbors, now Central Park United Neighbors. Um, under the kind of year in review, I wanted to include a little bit of a look back on the beginning of Sun uh, um, in 2004, um, just to kind of give a little bit of that history as part of the annual forum. Um, uh, and then in June, we'll be welcoming new members, um, electing officers on um, just conversation uh, to get folks involved. We don't meet in July, so that leaves August, September, October, and then a joint November, December meeting open. Um, and so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll open that up now for folks um, about some ideas of what topics we should cover. It really isn't very many more meetings. Um, we also can we also can kind of play around a little bit with the meeting um, agenda and format so that if there is more than one topic that's really important to cover and we don't have enough meetings, maybe we forego community update, community partner updates or committee updates um, or use the board hour for some of that conversation. So I'll stop talking now uh, and open it up to the people on Cube and on, um, on Zoom. As you had asked me question and I yeah. directors um, so we could put something on the agenda for September October time frame. we're actually working on a presentation that we can oh that would be fantastic up. so uh, you're gonna learn about taxes so well no I I like think that this is super important especially because people are really concerned about their property taxes oh yeah they're gonna if keep going many mills go to the metro districts I think a metro district 101 like kind of presentation is super, super. The short answer is those mills are going to keep going up until 2051 at the earliest. Thank you. They're going to go up. For that news. Well, the money's going to keep going up. <laughs> mills will stay the same. No, the mill will be the same. Yes. Say one thing, is there a, a, an opportunity for those mills to go down? And so there is not. Okay. Well, in like, I'd like to late 30s or early. Okay. okay. So. So we've talked about uh, Russ Ramsey speaking about choice. I was kind of hoping to do it sooner, although so the end of his tenure with yes this month, the end of this month, and I thought that it would be better for him to speak after that um, so that he would be speaking as a free agent as opposed to he's currently the director of enrollment and um, campus planning. So other people who've worn that hat are Liz Mendez. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's a that's someone who I would be in. And I feel like that would be, I don't, I mean, I kind of want it to be like longer with opportunity for discussion. Um, but that's just kind of a, you know, anytime we have a speaker where there's an opportunity for, for discussion, I feel like we end up just kind of like rushing through this portion and then don't have enough time to just speak. Yeah, we don't want to like attending to like not have that. I agree. Any the last couple of speakers we've had, we didn't get anywhere. I mean, they're there, but they we only get like ten minutes to talk, so it's like they we don't really get a lot of info. So it's kind of it's really frustrating because if you're, I mean, I spread it around and it looked like a lot of people were going to come on, but if she's not on right away when they're logging on. To talk about all this stuff, then I think you know they you're not going to stay and listen. So, is there? I mean, I would rather have the person get like a dedicated first. She, 
you know, 30 minutes and, you know, a solid 30 minutes and then talk about all the other little stuff. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good suggestion. <laughs> so just starting the so yes speaker at 630 yeah. and then, yeah, what have you. I think that there is much value in having information from the Denver Police Department each month. Like One of yeah. the yeah. biggest things that I get bothered about, probably daily, is somebody that has some new grievance about crime in the neighborhood. And I and there's like nobody's ever talking about it. How do I talk to the police? And I remind them, the police come to the CPUN meeting every month. You just aren't going to the meeting. And so I think that that is something, especially as this continues to be a concern of folks, is we're sent down with the police to talk to them every month. I think there's certain people that have to come all the time, but there's certain people that like the library That's a quarter. No, and I think kind of some of but flipping what I do to me. So well, I'm, I'm glad I'm I'm really glad like, like that is a very simple thing. Yeah. Kind of, I think logistics yeah. can be worked out and how we juxtapose things can be worked out. And I like the idea of having the speaker yeah. from the get go. Yeah. And absolutely. if we ran over a little bit with that, that's better. Then, right. Um, I mean, what people are tuning in for when we're trying to advertise them coming is for us a, a specific speaker. You know, like it's great that we're giving these these community updates, but like you said, you can put that in the click rate. And well, we can, yes, it doesn't like Things the bluff lady. Like, she doesn't need to be here every time. And she, say that again. The bluff lake lady. Oh, she, she likes to come talk. So and it's great. I mean, all the updates are great. It's just that if we have a specific, if the residents are very concerned about certain things, then we need to yeah. give them the opportunity to get that off their chat. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean I no, I agree one hundred percent. Right. And have felt very frustrated and didn't know like what to do. And now we actually have the conversation, like we're actually having this conversation instead of just kind of like, oh my God, we can't do like what's on the agenda. So this this is really, I, I, I mean, certain speakers, I think you can actually give them a full hour just because it is so we did a Q and A if you kind of, yeah. More like a town hall. Well, I was going right. to say like a safety town hall, like is something that I think we always get, like get a lot of interest in and that, and, and, I think um, for that, it would be really helpful, um, Amanda, to kind of circle back with um, Lieutenant Hines about some of the, the data um, stuff that we had to discuss. I, I, I kind of want to share an aha moment that I had when we talked to, to Hines. Like I, I, I realized like where he's coming from with all of these presentations that if you go and you look at the statistics on the Denver Police website, Central Park looks horrible but he comes at these like every talk um oh hi lieutenant Hines, you're still <laughs> every meeting like thinking about like if someone started by looking at the website the dpd website and seeing the distribution of statistics like what would they then need to know as opposed to like what does someone need to know if they don't know anything at all um and so that that was helpful for me to kind of have a better sense of like what how he's framing things but i feel like we could help the help the community have a better baseline of of the statistics that are, should be general knowledge because it's publicly available information um thank you general public yeah we do that we're having a difficult time hearing you guys. Can someone who's with in front of the microphone repeat what's being said? Yeah, we can hear Jack and we can hear Liz and Amanda and Carol, but some other people were having trouble. Yeah, that would be. Oh yeah, I was just yeah, I was just suggesting like adding more uh, statistics to the C fund, but I was told that. 
that's already a thing, so. Like the general statistics though, like what, 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 what statistics are we are already reporting? What do you mean? Yeah, just like you say how um all this information is available on the DPD website, but I like didn't know that actually. Um, so it would have been useful like coming here and seeing like if a graph on like having its own dedicated slideshow would have been useful. Just getting it more out there and making it more um known to the general public because I'm not constantly going to the DPD website looking at, you know, statistics. It would have to be shoved in my face for me to really You think that's weird that I do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, so I would say that also, I mean, alongside statistics, they have to be contextualized. So I think it's the contextual. Like, yeah, that is like website. It's contextualized. Yeah. But like what we talk about here is kind of like one step removed from that. I was statistics every month. For 28 days. But I mean, do we know what their open rate is on their stuff? No. <laughs> I mean, that would be helpful because I think a lot of people probably would go to the source, right? Versus, I mean, it's great if we want to I think market it, but I mean, I think a lot of people would just go straight to the source. So if they're getting their statistics from directly from the police, then that would be great. I think that people don't actually care about the so news that are just big. Yeah. yeah, they have it. That's why I'm wondering. So there's this if big news direct people every every month. Yeah, um, I don't know, Lieutenant Hines, if you wanted to chime in here. Um, I I guess does the District Five send out an email newsletter every month? Um, and who who would be the contact person that I could just kind of talk to about like a, a sense of interest in? I, because I, depends on how big the rate is, but. Sorry, I uh, had something in the background there for a minute, but was the question regarding, um, do we send out a, a newsletter as a DPD District 5? Yes, yes. So we haven't done that, although that's an interesting idea, and I'm wondering if it's something we could roll in with. We do our monthly commanders meeting, and we make those slides available to everyone. So um, I think that's what we're talking about there is yeah. community, uh, a community outreach person who changes all the time. Like um, it, is it like yeah. the CRO? Yeah. 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 It, yeah, our community average. resource officers are still pretty stable in District 5. Um, we have Catherine McCandless. Yeah. Um, Danae Ferenz is still serving as a community resource officer for us. She's just on a temporary assignment to major crimes. And then Lisa Preciado, who's some of the well, she's away at her temporary assignment. But um, either of them would be a good uh, point person for that. And, uh, you know, we might be able to make something even into more of a newsletter form as well. I mean, I don't necessarily want to have more of these points, but I guess when they make the slides from the commander's meeting available, is that just, is there a link or does it get circulated out to an email list? It's a PDF that we it's can post once a month. Okay, because I'm just wondering if there's a way to link to that. I'd be happy to just have, like, in our community emails, linking it like whenever that whatever email is closest to whenever the commander's meeting happened, just directing folks to you know to that resource. Um, it just so that it doesn't. I I mean I know the work that goes into making newsletters, so I don't want to okay. add. More, but if there's a way that we can. Just be happy to just kind of include that as part of what we put in the email newsletter since it's yeah. our audience. So, and that's a great idea. I'll talk to Catherine tomorrow and find out if she puts it anywhere that she has a link to. I think in the past, she's always sent it out to an email distribution list. I don't know if it would work to just send a copy to you guys or if you'd actually need a link from our end. Um, I, I do believe in the past, she's just emailed it to anybody who wanted it. Yeah, no, I know that the city doesn't use Google Drive, but something like that, like, like very simple, just upload the PDF to Google Drive, send us the link and we'll share it. So something 
you know, if, if there's some kind of workaround like that, I, I think that that would probably be the most efficient way of getting that information. Yes. Liz, we could just upload it to our Google Drive and put a link in our email. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. That works. So um, I can talk to Catherine and kind of make that a thing too, where we can send yeah. it to you guys um, each month after the meeting. And uh, or whenever we actually, have. a lot of times we don't have the final slide deck done until we're actually the day of the meeting. We're usually making some additions or subtractions or adjustments and things like that. But um, whenever we have the final slide deck done, um, I'm sure we'd be happy to, at the very least, email it to you if we couldn't put it onto some kind of Google Drive. Um, as you recognize, we have some uh, limitations uh, placed on us in terms of what we're allowed to do in terms of where we can upload stuff, what kind of social media we can use, things of that nature. But um, we can get it to you one way or another. Okay, that, that, sounds, that sounds good. Um, um, and uh, we'll probably be in touch about uh, a future CPUN meeting um, for a uh, safety town hall. Um, so, okay. <laughs> structural thing just about like the flow yeah meeting. so we didn't used to have committee updates in the first half of oh okay the outreach meeting um that used to be entirely contained in the board meeting and then the idea was that we weren't really featuring anything about our organization during that outreach meeting it was completely limited to the board meeting so if there's if if there's maybe a happy medium between like highlighting just like one committee or just like brief mention of, I don't know if that could just like shrink the footprint of committee updates down to like, like maybe like five minutes and then just like sketch it out like five minutes for yourselves, 10 minutes for police, 15 minutes for something else then and then to uh, Yeah, no, I, um, I think that's good. I, I yeah. Yeah, there was some concern that people weren't necessarily wanting to stick around for the stuff that was going on in the community, so they were not getting those updates. And so that's why we shifted to have those updates first. And I, I do want to say I do appreciate you bringing the young men bringing to our attention, like, what your perspective is, because not everybody gathers their information in the same way. And so when people come out and voice what they're seeing, it helps us. And Jack, you you are a little bit different in that not everyone going through and <laughs> and reading that stuff. So um I I definitely opportunity for us to learn to move forward. And so we need these voices. So thank you. Yeah. And, and something that I, um, that I, you know, I, like since joining the CPON board and now serving in this role, I see one of the values of Central Park United Neighbors is providing information, is, is just kind of providing information that's not necessarily just on social media. Um, and so I, I do like, I, I do think of like that, like just providing the opportunity to have a different, you know, and the front really comes out, you know, once a month and, you know, like they may or may not report on things. So having this as a forum for where people get reliable information, I think is really important. So in depth, which we have not really had the opportunity to do. Um, but those those are kind of what I would like to make sure we're kind of hitting going forward um, at our meetings. So it's also a problem because meetings are important, right? Yes. And a lot of conversation has revolved around people like tuning in for certain speakers in particular and ignoring the rest. Um, and like, do you upload these? The They're on YouTube groups? and we share them in the um, email updates. So given that, you can put like little timestamps on yeah. YouTube and you could also put those timestamps in your email newsletter. 
to so that you could have people who are interested in just one speaker actually go and listen just to just like that speaker. Table of contents. Exactly. Yeah. How many people actually view it though? Um, that's a good question, Mark. I I haven't been um. as the newsletter email, do you, do you look at the kind of metrics um, on like the, I, I guess the number of views, I guess we can kind of look at it right now. But if, if you know that off the top of your head, that would be great. So is this something that you know how to do yourself? Would you be able to volunteer your services and come in and put those timestamps on and that sort of thing for the communications department? Yeah, I could do that. It's like stuff right there. It would surely be pretty easy um, yeah. to just like put little timestamps in. I just have to like read through it and like. Does everybody know who's speaking right now? Introduce yourself. Yes, please hey. introduce yourself. Please. My name is Nicholas Collins. I'm Sandra's son. I'm not actually part of this, but. You're going to. I, I figured now. I you opened your mouth. First mistake. I figured I'd participate since this isn't like um the house or where, where I need. Um, but yeah, because it, it can't be too difficult to just add little timestamps in. So, so something that's interesting. So that let's talk because I am. I also yeah. I I think I've that was a great idea. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's interesting. So we have ninety nine views for last month's meeting, October, the October meeting in twenty twenty three has five hundred and twenty six views. What did we do in October? I think that was the last Brookfield update. That was. So it was the development update. And I'm sure so. it didn't like really go through all one hour and 44 minutes of that. Yeah. And so it really helped them out by just putting little timestamps so that they could. The INC, which is the umbrella organization for all RNOs, does that. It's minute by minute. And it's very helpful. So, yeah. No, so I, I think that. Liz, it sounds like you need to add another uh, activity for either the yeah, Outreach Communications be. Committee or the Secretary for uh, going forward. Yeah. It's not going to be Mark. <laughs> well, you said it, but yeah. You can that's it, because when I've uploaded things, it says, like, allow chapters, but it doesn't automatically necessarily automatically generate um that I, it might have to do with how, like what the source uh, file has in it. So, give me your information. It's off. Oh, yeah. so, okay. Um, um, okay. Hey, the, one thing I would add to keep in oh, mind please. is uh, when we send out the emails about what the meeting is going to be, the more we can highlight the shall we say, preferred speakers or most interested speakers, the more likely it is that people are going to come back and, and look at it. Because I think, I don't know if our last few emails have highlighted that as clearly as, as uh, some of the ones used to. Because I think yeah, like November I, was probably crime or something like that too. I don't forget. I, I think I, I, I think I put that in the last email, but we have one going out next Monday. So I'll definitely do that. And I also embedded the video um, in the email itself instead of just being an outside link. Um, so, okay. Um, yeah. Hey, Liz, I was I was just going to make a point. I, I, I Mark, Mark and has done a yeoman's job here. But yeah. once we start something, we also have to have documentation of how they do it, what they do, because Sandra, your son, and I, I'm sorry, you, I didn't remember your name, but you're going to go off to college and you're going to not want to do this. And um, so we need to make sure that we document that because I think a lot of times we start, we don't know how it's done. And, and even, you know, as simple as just showing a few people. Yeah. I was going to say, let, you, you might want to look up, other than Jack, you can look at the median age in this room. What's the so, well, like for your age? What is the YouTube? <laughs> that, is the kids use that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it is, it is like a little past 815. I wanted to make sure that we had enough time to kind of just talk about the recruitment update. Um, and that is, uh, I, 
I think that we wanted to kind of have a closed session. Sorry. You're getting kicked out. You're getting kicked out. And, and for folks on the Zoom who are, are not uh, board members, um, we can, uh, this is kind of the end of the meeting. Um,